So the first part that I'm going to talk about, which is uh, this thing here, what is the Here's what Khalid Brankhanship was supposed to say. Uh, uh, and uh, now there's Jonathan is going to say that, and I don't know whether he's going to cover that or not. Uh, let's first talk about what the importance of the topic is. And the importance of the topic really isn't ISIS. ISIS are new players. They have no credibility. No one really cares about them, especially among among Muslims, especially among scholars. Uh, it's a flash that will go away like many other flashes have. Uh, but the fact is that the Muslim people, the Muslim people, uh, the majority Muslim countries, actually are in favor of, quote, an Islamic state. And they have no idea what that means. Uh, they have no idea what that means, just as uh, Pakistanis had no idea that they just formed the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Uh, uh, my father was a part of that, that thing simply because it was freedom. Uh, and there was never really a talk. When I came to Georgetown, no one asked about the Islamic State, because it was not a topic. Uh, the Jesuits were not interested in it, uh, and my philosophy professors, they were not interested in it. The grassroots see the Sharia, actually, simply as something that works. Uh, and they think it's a solution to the corruption uh, in their governments and in their countries. Uh, the outsiders, however, I just call it in general, the outsiders claim that they want to establish a worldwide uh, caliphate uh, that will be oppressive to women uh, and for the non-Muslims. So it is still, this, this topic is not going away. Uh, so the question is, do they derive, whoever they are, do they derive their authority from the Quran or the Sunnah? Uh, and uh, there's another group uh, that has, it's not new, I call them statists. Uh, uh, instead of talking about the Quran or the Sunnah, uh, they want to establish for a state. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, uh, because the state that they want to establish is not an Islamic state by any stretch of the imagination. It's a modern state uh, where all power resides in the government. Now, the way my mind works, the first thing I want us to, to, to do is to say, let's define some terms. What do we mean by a state? And I'm not going to go too into it. We have unions, we have commonwealth, we have federations. Uh, you know, the United States itself is not a state, it's the United States. Uh, and actually we have, what is it, three commonwealths? So they're not all states. Virginia, Massachusetts. 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 Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. Three. Yeah. So three commonwealths. Uh, and uh, we need to think about why they are called commonwealths. In the, in the Arabic terminology, in Muslim terminology, uh, the word Sultan actually appears a lot in the Quran. Uh, and it is still used, and Sultan is power, might, authority, and so on. Uh, but the only Sultan we have in the Muslim countries now is, I think, the Oman. Is that the only Sultan? Oh my. Brunei. 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 Brunei.
الدولة العربية في العراق والشام يحصل الدعيش كم صار؟ And people say, well, it's a, it, it, that's not who they are. Well, it, actually, that's what they call themselves. And the rest of the Muslim world still call them Daesh. Uh, so it's a dawla. Mamlaka just means the things that we own. And we have a lot of mamlakas. Mamlaka, Saudi, Arabia, which means the things that are owned by this corporation called Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then we have the word Khilafa. Uh, well, the word Khilafa or Khalifa is the singular. The word Khalifa is used in the Quran only twice. One in relationship with uh, Adam, where God says to the angels, Inna ja'alna khalifa, uh, that, that uh, we are going to uh, appoint a Khalifa, and I want to spend a few minutes to talk about what that means, and the second time it is used for him. Uh, uh, and it says, oh David, we have appointed you the Khalifa uh, to do justice between people by truth without following your own desire. So it doesn't say you have the authority to do whatever you want. It simply says you have a responsibility to do justice and if you use your own desires you are going to be in trouble. Uh, uh, the Quran uses the word khulafa alat, the plural. And it uses it in the sense of people succeeding each other. Uh, so when one nation is, is an authority, uh, they fall, another group comes and the Quran says now you succeeded the other people. So it's clearly uh, successor, and I think all translators uh, do for successor. I just quickly went through this thing here, and I have a habit of doing that. Among the recent translations, uh, the, during the 20th century, we have Ashraf Ali Thanwi, and those of you who know something about it, he, he was a great scholar from, from Duban, and he wrote his thing by the Quran in Urdu. Uh, and, and, and he, he actually says, uh, uh, you are a subordinate. Mm -hmm. uh, he calls it a naib. Okay. A naib is a subordinate, if you want deputy, but certainly not a boss. Uh, Muhammad Ali calls it a ruler. I think it's important to, one of the reasons I do this is, I want people to understand that the translators don't translate in vacuum. So it depends upon the time and the place where they are and what perspective they bring to it. Muhammad Ali is a part of the Ahmadiyya movement uh, and they split and he went one direction and he wrote a lot of stuff in English and he wants to emphasize the fact that we are going to have rulers come from that group uh, and he makes a big point out of calling this a ruler. Uh, well, Pickthall, I couldn't find the date on the thing I had, he called it Viceroy. Well, he's English. So the only thing he could think of as, as, as the deputy uh, is the second to the Roy rather than anything else. And Yusuf Ali, who wanted to impress us that he's writing in good English, he calls it vice giant, uh, which no one knows, and if you look it up, you may be able to find what it means. But it kind of means viceroy, but not quite the same. Uh, and the N.J. Daoud, and I put some dates in here. Uh, N.J. Daoud, who is an Iraqi, I believe, Iraqi Christian, uh, uh, he uh, uh, decided to kind of explain it. So he says. The one who shall rule as my representative, as my successor, to God's name. And Abu Lala Mududi just uses the word Khalifa, and I think deliberately because he was a statist. He wanted to establish a state, uh, and Khalifa had acquired a meaning in, in Urdu uh, that meant uh, you have some kind of an authority. 
And Thomas Cleary, which you may or may not have heard of, who's a linguist, uh, uh, he simply went back to deputy. So overall, uh, Khalifa just means deputy at the most, with no authority independent of the authority given to the deputy and whoever the chief is, which is God. Uh, okay, I want to very quickly go to what happens at the beginning. Uh, and I may not be looking at this thing because I get, I get distracted when I have this thing in front of me. Uh, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, um, contrary to the general impression, the people didn't just run around gathered together and said, Abu Bakr, you are Abu Khalifa, the Khalifa of the Prophet. Uh, in fact, the Muslims of Medina itself were divided into at least three groups, well-defined groups. Uh, the group of Banu Hashim uh, centered around Ali, but actually the meetings were all in the house of Fatima. Prophet's daughter. Uh, uh, and they continued to meet in her house for as long as she lived, which was six months. Uh, and they claim uh, that the Khalafa, the one who succeeds the Prophet, should be within the family of the Prophet, which they claim to be uh, uh, them. Uh, in, in, in fact, since there was no male heir, it, uh, they said that was Ali. Uh, the rest of the Quraysh in Medina uh, had a very high regard for Abu Bakr uh, and they were uh, willing to accept him as the leader. Uh, and then the third group was, we called them Ansar, but in fact, there were many, many tribes, and they were not really united. The Aus and Khazraj and many, many others. Uh, uh, but they were willing to choose one of them by saying, well, you know, the Prophet was here, we accepted his authority, but now that he's gone, we think one of us should have the authority. Uh, so they met in this, this house uh, of Abu Sa'idah. Uh, and Sa'ad, the chief, was actually sick. Uh, but they were meeting there and Ali uh, Umar found out and he grabbed Abu Bakr and he says, we better go there because we don't know what they're going to do and then we'll have to clean up the mess. Uh, so they went there and they were talking about how the Ansar had the right to have the authority because they took care of the Prophet and they gave him shelter and in fact they said there are more of us than you and uh, that actually explicitly says you know we gave you shelter so they did not consider them as citizens in any sense of the word they were still visitors that is not unusual in the old world you can be in a place for generations and you are still wherever you came from uh, but the whole thing was that one of them wanted to be the leader. And Abu Bakr spoke up to say, well look, there are Muslims now, Mu'minin, outside of this, this town. And they will not accept the authority of a non Quraysh. Quraysh being the most respected tribe uh, which had the authority and the control over Mecca in the holy places way back then uh, will be accepted for to people more easily not unquestionably but more easily uh, and he said well I hear two people I have choose uh, uh, Homer or, or, or uh, uh, this other guy it doesn't matter who the other guy is because no one was going to think about it. And actually the things didn't get come. 
If you read the literature, you find that people got very heated, swords were drawn, and things were getting pretty ugly. So Omar immediately took the hand of Abu Bakr and says, I do bay'ah on your hands. And he had already told the gathering that Abu Bakr is the best among them and quoted the stories that he was the second one in the cave and he was appointed by the Prophet to lead the prayer and, and many, many of those things which no one could deny. Uh, so when he did it, the others followed first from the Quraysh and then from, from the things. So here is the so-called quick election. It was pretty, pretty ugly. Uh, the next morning, the Prophet now is still not buried. The next morning, before the prayer, Umbar stood up and told people to do the bayah of Abu Bakr. <coughs> and they did. Uh, well, uh, somewhere in here, I think I have a... I think it's important to look at the first statements they make. I call them inaugural actresses, uh, which is what we call them today. <coughs> and instead of, you know, uh, doing the, the, the exact translation where we end up with things like I do so and so, inshallah, there are lots of inshallahs in it. Uh, you can just look at what they said. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, Umar had said, and he is the best among us. So the first thing Abu Bakr said was, I've been given authority over you and I'm not the best among you. The second thing was, if I do well, help me. If I don't do well, correct me. And the third was, the weak among you will be strong with me until I have restored their rights to them. And the strong among you will be weak towards me until I have taken away your rights from him, from them. Obey me if I obey God. And if I don't obey God and his messenger, you, you owe me nothing. So you can see what the messages are and I don't have to do an analyzing. When Abu Bakr was sick, he knew from experience that if he just leaves it to the process, we'll have an ugly scene again. So he talked to individual people, the so-called well-known leaders, and said, I'm going to nominate Omar. There was not unanimity. In fact, almost everybody said, well, he's a good man, but he's harsh. Uh, and Abu Bakr says, well, he's harsh because I'm soft. When I'm gone, he will become soft. In any case, he writes it down and announces it to the general public and he gets, he gets elected. Omar actually becomes soft and he turns out to be a very good administrator. Uh, and I have, um, let's see if I have it. Here is what he said. It's five things. Uh, I will not exact any taxes or levies that are not authorized by law. The very first thing he said, all lawful, lawfully realized taxes will be used only in your interest. Three, it is my duty to protect the frontiers of your lands. Guess what is missing? Conquer new lands. Simply says, I'm going to defend the frontiers of your land. It is my duty to protect your prosperity and look after your interests. And it is my obligation to do justice. And the reason it's important to look at these inaugural addresses is that they sound very modern. Because these were concepts that were not that well known among the people, except the people did have a, a tradition of consulting with each other. And when they called him the Khalifa, 
he actually ridiculed it. He said, well, Abu Bakr was the Khalifa of the Prophet, so who am I the Khalifa? Am I the Khalifa of Abu Bakr? And then who will be my successor, the Khalifa of Omar, who is the Khalifa of Abu Bakr? I mean, this is ridiculous. Because he took it only as meaning a successor. Nothing with authority or anything. But being smart, when someone said, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he said, that's a good one. Guess why that is a good one? It has the word Amr in it. He will have an authority. Uh, I'll give you a little short list and I don't know whether I will make a copy of some of these. Uh, Omar actually... How would you translate into English Amir al-Mu'min? The Amir, the one who has the authority to give instructions of the believers. Uh -huh. okay. Amir is just the one who has the authority of Amr, which is just instruction. So it has nothing to do with commander. Why? Commander. Military commander. No, no, no. It means no. commander. I mean, if you, well, you no, I mean in his, from so, the original. Yeah, I mean, the, the Amir, but Amir also means prince, prince or right. leader, just someone who has authority. Okay. Because nowadays they translate as commander of the faithful. But one, of the, one, of, the, yeah. well, one of the things is that if you if you start thinking of these things in the current terms, of which later became the term, that's the problem, which is what I'm trying to right. to, to correct. Uh, Amir, uh, um, I asked one person once, I said, so when does someone become a sheikh? Mm -hmm. And he said, $10 million. <laughs> uh, and of course, now $10 million is not enough. So anyone who has $10 million is a shape, which literally means an old man, a leader, someone to be respected. And so. uh, anyways, here is a list of things. And the most important thing in here is uh, uh, he permitted business people from the belligerent nations to come and do business. Uh, he established uh, allowances for among the for the poor of the Christians and the Jews. I mean, these are all kind of modern ideas. Uh, uh, we consider them. Uh, uh, he, he announced uh, daily allowances for people who took care of the street children. I mean, literally street children. And we don't think they were, but they were street children, and so on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not spend too, too, too much, but the uh, uh, Omar then had a big problem in naming his successor. Because there was no one he could name that everyone would as easily get behind as they got behind him, because Abu Bakr said he's a good man. So he appointed a committee. Sounds familiar? Mm -hmm. And the people who put on the committee are all from the Ashram Basha, the ten who were given the good news by the Prophet. We have a little disagreement as to who they are, but these certainly are among them. And the one that is missing is Abu Bakr and Omar, who are also among the Ashram Basha. And these people actually had a problem. They discussed it, and one of the things they were mentioning is, well, uh, what model are we going to follow? And one of the things that they constantly came up is, whoever we choose has to have to follow the model of Abu Bakr and Omar. And Ali said no, and Uthman said yes, and that is how Uthman became the next one. Okay. Um, okay, that's it, I think. Yeah, because I'm going into now what would have been Khalid's because I have notes on Khalid's here because I end up doing it when, uh, when I have to. So that's it. <clears throat>
uh, uh, there was no concept of a Khalifa as the ultimate ruler with all the authority, this nonsense of someone called himself uh, Abu Bakr, uh, and he's a Sayyid, uh, and our press keeps on saying, well, you know, that means uh, he's a Khalifa by definition, and he has the authority. A Khalifa has the religious and temporal authority by definition. That's what our press keeps on saying. That's not true. Uh, so I'm going to leave it here that in the beginning there is no such thing as a Khalifa with a thing. The idea, the idea is, is there and uh, I'll, I'll leave it to, uh, to Dr. Brown. To, to, to do you, uh, maybe, because I have to, I emailed myself something which I had to pull up, so maybe if you want to answer some questions while I do that, then uh, I can start. So, does anybody have any questions in the meantime? But we can't have a lot of questions, just. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you, think, do you think that this problem of succession, yes. the beginning, yes. it's not, I don't think unique to this area, but do you think that translates in today's problems also? The real problem of successions of governments, there is no successor, nobody chooses a successor, and there's a revolution or the military takes over. Do you see some connection there? No, because what we have are modern states. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the old traditional states. The old traditional people actually were simpler, even though we think they're complicated. They were tribal systems, and each tribe had their own system. And if they wanted a higher person, they'll get together and choose one. Okay? And they'll say, you are not really better than us, but you know, you can do stuff. Uh, that tribal system actually still exists in, 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 in many Muslim countries. Uh, and in fact, to the extent that the tribal system exists, the modern governments have problems with them. Because you cannot uh, force them to do anything they don't want to do. I mean, Palestine is, 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 is a problem partly because Palestinians, they're small mountain villages, okay? They are independent thinking people. Uh, Afghanistan and the western Pakistan, they're all tribal people. Uh, and if they slowly move to something, it works. But forcing them to do something doesn't work. Uh, so, I, no, I don't think the problem is, is, the, is the old problem of succession because it was decided that we are not going to agree uh, and, and uh, leadership is going to be local and I'm uh, not going to get to that because uh, that Dr. Brown is going to handle it. Yes. How does Malik come into this, into this story? Malik just means a king. Yeah. But what did the, the Prophet say about Malik? Uh, the ones who own something. Oh, he says, um, a man cannot go to, to heaven. <laughs> well, I don't think he said that. But the, <laughs> but the thing is that the... He the, didn't like marriage. Well, I mean, the, the, the Quran talks about uh, the Bani Israel asking the Prophet to name a malik for them, uh -huh. a king for them, uh, and, and they didn't like the one he, he named. Uh -huh. Uh, and the, the only negative about the word Malik in the Quran is uh, where uh, 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 Bilqis, uh, the Queen of Sheba, receives a letter from uh, from David, uh, from uh, Suleiman, uh, and, 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 and uh, she says to the people, uh, I've received this letter, give me your expert opinion. Fatwa. Give me your fatwa. And they said, well, you know, we are strong and blah, 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 and we can, we can defeat him. And she said, uh, I think we are not going to want a confrontation. In the muluk, afsaduha wa ja'alu ahliha adilla wa When the kings enter a town, they mess it up. That's what afsaduha means. They sure. make the best among them, the lowest among them, and that's what they do. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the only uh, 
and if they're not uh, uh, a king, they assign themselves like the, uh, most of the dictators in the Arab world. They assign themselves as uh, royalty. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, there's some... Yeah. 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 I have some comment also. Uh, from your brief presentation, I couldn't surmise whether you um, proposed that there is a concept of caliphate in Islam or there isn't. There isn't. There isn't. Yes. Okay. Not a universal one. Yeah, that's Not what I mean. That's the lack of the life. Not a universal one. Maulana Maududi's concept or Jamaluddin Afghani's. Uh, so there is no... As well, well, I mean, Jamaluddin Afghani is an entirely different issue. Yeah, he, was, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was not an Afghani. Yeah, anyways. but Maulana Maududi. Yes. The lack of the life or whatever he presented. So I understand. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Just quickly. I can see where you're... Uh, where you point to the fact that there is no uh, precedent for an absolute authority or ruler based mm -hmm. on the way the caliph Khalifa is the, defined. But it seems to me that even in all the cases you explained that there was some sort of absolute unity in some sort of government form, regardless of how powerful or not powerful the leader was. So do you think maybe there may not be a precedent for absolute rule, but a precedent for a unified rule? No, because there was never absolute unity. In fact, the, the people of Medina themselves were not united and they were never united uh, even after the leaders were chosen. When Abu Bakr was chosen, Ali never took the bay'ah uh, until after Fatima died. Mm -hmm. And that's another interesting story. Uh, but I mean, uh, there are, you know, you can have disagreements, internal disagreements still have yeah. political unity. So I mean, there was political unity even if there's I mean, there weren't multiple states inside Medina. There was just disagreements, just like Republicans and Democrats disagree over who would be the best president. Exactly. There's still yeah. one, one president. Yeah. But not absolute unity, because there is no absolute unity, because we disagree on almost everything. And it's, and it's considered to be OK. But in the form of a modern political state, there would be. But that's a modern political state and not an Islamic state. Well, why don't we look to any more questions at the ends? This seems like it's working. I can certainly hear myself in yeah. the natural way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you're going to have to all experience something horrible. My handwriting. <laughs> this is actually me trying to write legend. Uh, you don't want to see the normal handwriting. I don't know what happened to me. I look at my notes when I was in grad school. It's all very clear. Now, I think there's just some psychological stress that just, you can, actually this isn't, I think I have now a, actually a learning disability. I think I could get, some of my students, they, 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 their handwriting is so bad, they get to use computers. It's technically learning uh, disability. Um, so suffer briefly, and then hopefully I'll be able to decipher everything for you. I, I thought I would just talk about kind of a history of the concept of caliphate and how it interacts with other notions of authority, or at least political authority, and uh, concept of political legitimacy in the Islamic civilization. Now, one of the first things to keep in mind in uh, Islamic civilization is, as the great historian Marshall Hodgson called it, it's really better to call it Islamic hate civilization. Islamic hate civilization. Uh, why? Because Islamic civilization suggests that everything is rooted in Islam, has some basis in Islam, is an expression of Islam. Whereas what actually happened historically is that the Muslim conquest of the Middle East led to the creation of a, an amalgamation of the pre-existing cultural, political, religious traditions in the Near East and Islam, and then expressed itself in an Islamic idiom. But lots of the institutions of Islamic hate civilization, which ultimately spread um, from Morocco to Southeast Asia, many of those institutions, they're not mentioned in the Quran, they're not mentioned in the Sunnah of the, the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, they are institutions that are developed either from pre-existing uh, institutions that preceded Islam, or that Muslims came up with. Things like pious endowments, things like the madrasa, things like uh, mosques uh, or uh, things like the idea of the sultanate. Uh, these are all notions. The fact that you have someone in Brunei who calls himself the sultan of Brunei in, 
Indonesia, or sorry, Malaysia is a federation of, of multiple states, each with its own sultan. Uh, the Quran never says, verily, there is this notion of the sultanate, and this is what the office means. It's either something that was uh, in, inducted, maybe, by Muslim scholars from their scripture, and then uh, used to describe existing notions of rule. And so it's, it's actually these, these institutions, like uh, the Medrasa, the Sufi Brotherhood, um, the idea of sultanate, the Sharia, these institutions are what bind together Islamic Kate civilization. But not all of them are actually rooted in the original scriptures of Islam. So this is a very important distinction that, that Marshall Hodgson made and is very helpful. Uh, Amin's had to suffer through us and, and is discussing this in our Islamic Civ class where he was my TA for several years. Okay, so when you, when you begin with the, I thought we were just talking about sort of three concepts or idioms for talking about rule or authority that appear in the lifetime of the prophet and in the immediate, let's say 20 years after his death in 632 of the Common Era. One of them the, over here is imama. Imama means leadership generally. Now, if you look in, not only in the hadiths of the Prophet, his sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, which are uh, problematic as a source because a lot of them are made up after the death of the Prophet by various competing factions in political, secondary, and legal disputes. Uh, so they oftentimes reflect existing disputes instead of really exactly what the Prophet said. But if we assume that there's some origin of this material in the early Islamic period, you can see it expressed there. And you also see it expressed in fiqh or Islamic jurisprudence when they talk about concept of leadership. Uh, so if we talk, let's say, about the first 300 years of Islam, you have the notion of leadership is actually extremely important, just the imamah, for the theorization of authority, for the theorization of rule. Now, it becomes, there's ambiguity here because the person who leads the prayer is the imam. So we could all pray right now and I could be the imam. And I have no authority over you. I just have to be the person who leads the prayer. But the leader of the community is also called the imam. So Muslim legal scholars discuss the qualifications for imam as leadership of prayer, and they talk about the qualifications for imam as the leadership of the community. And there's the two overlap, because one of the things that the imam, the leader of a community, whether it's the leader of the Muslims overall, or the leader of a, of a city, or the governor of a province, one of the things he is supposed to do is lead the community in prayer. But uh, that, that ambiguity is important because you see that there is this overlap of religious leadership and temporal leadership. Now, the person who leads the prayer doesn't necessarily have any, like I said, I don't, my, the fact that I happen to think you know, certain thing is right or wrong in Islamic law, I have no right to force that upon the people whom I lead in prayer. But there is this notion of religious leadership in the sense of, act, of leading the, the community in prayer. The second concept is that of khilafah. That's the idea of successorship. And as you saw, this is the term that's invoked by Abu Bakr. He's the the Khalifa, the, success, the successor of the Prophet of God. <coughs> and the last one in, boy, this is, this is an R, I guess, Imara. Imara means command. So the, the word in Amir is the active participle, or the, 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 a noun from the, ver, the, 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 the verbal noun of Imara, of command. He's the commander. And oftentimes when the Prophet talks about commanders, he's talking about, I'm making someone a commander for a campaign. This person is your commander. You obey this person on this campaign. So it can be a commander in the limited sense of a military campaign, and it can be the commander in the greater sense of being the leader of the community. And that's, again, the term that Omar takes is mir mu'minin, the commander of the faithful. And this is the most common term you'll see for the first, uh, I'd say, 200, at least 200 years of Islamic history. And any of my students, since I have so much respect for you, having either had no impact on you or had a lot of impact on you, <laughs> any of you who think I've made a mistake and you want to correct me, please raise your hands. These two, because these two are very interested in political history. If you guys have any corrections, feel free to. I would, I would guess around the first 200 years, 
really, a meat of what we need is what the leaders call themselves. Commander of the faithful. Now, uh, so basically, time goes on. You have the first four caliphs who are often later termed the, the, the rightly guided caliphs, and Khulafa al Rashidun. Uh, oh, Abu Bakr rules for only two years. Omar rules for uh, 10 years, is assassinated. Uh, Uthman rules for 12 years, is assassinated. And Ali rules for three years, four five. years, is assassinated. Five, yeah, five. Almost five. 656 to 660. For, let's say, four years. Uh, when you say assassinated, you don't mean killed in battle. Do you? No, I mean assassinated, you know, like, I'm going to pray, like, stabbed in the back, assassinated. That's how Ali was. Um, a man was killed in his house by right, a, right, a right. large group of disgruntled Muslims. Okay, that's and assassin. Omar was stabbed as well by an assassin. But Ali was killed in, during a war. No, no, no. He was killed when he was walking to... It was during a war, and right. there was a civil war going on. Right. But he was walking to the mosque to pray in Kufa, and he was stabbed by one, a Kharijite assassin. That's right. Even Mojang was his name. Okay. Then, uh, in the first civil war, Basically, it starts about 656 to 660, and we won't go into what the different parties are, but the group that triumphs is the Umayyad dynasty, the Umayyad family, which then becomes the first dynasty. And uh, this is, when you were referring to about the prophet not liking kings, is in one hadith he talks about uh, you'll have a certain number of rightly guided caliphs, and then you'll have Malukun uh, Abd, which is uh, kings who bite, like, Kings who won't let go, they bite on and you just cling on. So there is this idea that kings don't really have legitimacy. Uh, they're, and, and then you, you in, see this with the in Umayyad. Allah's eyes. In Allah's eyes. Well, no, the king doesn't have legitimacy because a king, what is, I mean, it's very clear in the, the time of the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman and Ali that you don't get, you don't become the ruler because your father was a ruler. Become dynastic. the ruler through some kind of dynastic. Procedure. No dynastic. Yeah, there's not a dynastic notion. Whereas the Umayyads introduced the notion of, di of dynastic succession. Actually, right. Ali did too. Uh, no, I mean if you're if you're if you're a Shiite and you, then you believe that there is dynastic okay. succession, okay. but it's not dynastic succession just because you're the son. You're you 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 have succession from the previous Imam because your father happens to transfer to you. It's called nas or this uh, esoteric, perfect understanding of the religion. So your other sons are basically, you know, they can go be cobblers or whatever they want to do. But they have no, they have no right to succession. The only person with right to succession is the one who receives the and transmission of this authority. The anointment. Yeah. yeah so uh, it's not uh, when we talk about succession, you don't ask succession. You're talking about it's basically you're belonging to a certain family that gives you the right to rule. Uh, and that is introduced by the, the Umayyads. And of course, the Umayyad dynasty uh, makes their capital Damascus from 660 until the late six, uh, 740s when they're challenged by the last group that actually uh, successfully overthrows them in 750, the Abbasid dynasty. This is a dynasty that starts out in north, uh, north uh, eastern Persia, but is led by a descendant from the prophet's uncle Abbas. And so they take, they take the name of uh, the Abbasid dynasty. They build the city of Baghdad in the uh, 760s, and they, that's the imperial capital until uh, 1258. Well, there's, they occasionally go to other places when they feel like it, but that's basically the capital until 1258 when it's sacked by the Mongols. Now, um, around, and there's no exact date here, sometimes people like to talk about the year 945, but I think that's on the later end. From the mid-800s to the mid-900s, an important change occurs in the, this Muslim empire. It is one state. Uh, in 636, 637, the Muslims conquer Syria and Iran. In 650, they re in Central Italy, they've reached the city of Marv, which is now on the border between uh, Uzbekistan and, and Tajikistan, or sorry, Tajikistan and uh, uh, Iran. In 711, they invade Iberia, the Iberian Peninsula, and also Sindh in India. So you see this huge territorial conquest that, that uh, occurs. And one of the features of pre-modern states is that if you have a large territorial 
a large area of territorial control in theory, it's going to be actually very hard to control that in reality. States simply do not have the technology to do that. They don't have the technology for in terms of communication, in terms of transportation, in terms of administration. So what happens is this, as long as you're expanding, you can maintain control because your armies, you're, you're, they're off fighting other people. The second you stop expanding, you have a problem because now these armies are saying, well, what are we going to do now? Who's going to pay us? And if I'm not getting any spoils of war, someone's going to start paying me a salary. And if you, just start, if you don't get, give them a salary from the central government, then they eventually kind of carve out local uh, statelets or, or states that are under the suzerainty of the central state, but in reality are pseudo-independent. So you get basically the emergence of local, local dynasties. This begins really in the early to mid-800s, and by the, the mid-900s, it's become the reality. By the mid-900s, the Abbasid Caliphs are no longer exercising any real temporal authority except maybe just in Baghdad. Even then, they don't really, uh, actually, they're, they're at that point a figurehead. And this is a process that, that begins, let's say, the mid 800s and completes in the, the mid 900s. At that point, you have a new, by that time, a new mode of rule, conception of, of state has developed. You have the caliph, and this is really when the notion of the caliph becomes important. Before that, it, you know, it's one of these things. When someone's really in power, they don't need to stress that they're in power. You know, if someone's really the authority, they don't have to sit around talking about the authority all the time. They might even not even have a title. They're just the person in charge. Uh, it's really when you have a splitting of, let's say, theoretical or nominal symbolic authority and actual temporal authority, then you have to, then titles become much more important. So what happens in the mid-900s is this group called the uh, Buya dynasty, it's a, basically a band of warlord Turkic brothers from, well, they're Persians actually, from northeastern Iran. Uh, they come, they take over all Iran, they take over Iraq, and they go to Baghdad and they become the protector, they offer to become the protector of the caliph. And that's, they rule under this title. They are the protectors of the caliph. But in fact, the caliph is now, in effect, uh, as he had been for some time before that, actually a hostage and uh, under the, the control of whoever is really in charge. And this is where you have really a distinction between the sultan, which is the authority, and basically what that means is a military warlord. And thus you happen to live in you know, the, the, the Republic of Venice or the Republic of uh, um, uh, Ragusa, later Dubrovnik. <coughs> Most human beings in history live under some kind of military authority because a person who has weapons and the ability to, to force people to obey uh, and to provide their security uh, will, will be the ruler. So this, uh, the Sultan is really a, a, an effective military warlord of one form or the other. In the, in the central Islamic lands from the 900s until the 1200s, they're either a Persian or they're uh, Turkic. In some cases, there's a few dynasties, local dynasties, like in Mosul, where they're Arabs, but most of the time they're uh, Turkic or Persian. And, uh, and so you have Sultan with an S, that's an S at the end, in brackets, because it, there's not just one Sultan anymore. So the, the Buyids happen to control Iran and Iraq, but there's all sorts of other dynasties. There is the Ikhshidi dynasty in Egypt, there is dynasty in Tunis, there is dynasty in what's now Morocco, there is a dynasty in what's now Yemen, there is dynasty in the uh, parts of Iran outside of Buyid control. And these are all sultans. And in theory, they all recognize the nominal authority of the Abbasid Caliph. They will print coins, if, if they mint coins, they mint coins with the title of the, or the picture of the Abbasid Caliph. Uh, if they, in their Friday prayer sermons, you hear prayers for the Abbasid Caliph. So the Abbasid Caliph, the Caliph really uh, continues to provide the overarching theoretical unity of Islamic civilization, of this Islamic state, even though in reality you have lots of different local uh, authorities who are really in charge. So uh, this was, should not have, this should have been over here, but I wrote it too early. 1258, important date, Baghdad falls, uh, conquered by the Mongols. And people oftentimes, yes? 
Is that a problem with that? No, no, no. <laughs> no you just, just an exception to that, that the Fatimid the, the dynasty actually had a large and large territory, but did not adhere to the caliph. They oh yeah, well, well, that's a good point. But I'll I'll, just, I'll I'll mention that. That's a good point. Um, yes, that's a, it's an important point. So I actually was planning to talk about, but uh, the. The, even the term caliph doesn't become that important. So 945, the Buyids take over. Now, early, earlier in the 900s, a, a, a Shiite religious movement that began in Syria and then was defeated there and moved over into North Africa, what's now Algeria, and then with the help of this Berber tribe, basically takes over North Africa and eventually in the 960s conquers Egypt and creates, founds the city of, what's now the city of Cairo in around 969. That, in the early 900s, that movement, which later becomes called the Fatimid dynasty, takes the title of caliph. So now, in the 920s, the title caliph is, starts become, it's, it becomes really a, yeah. more of a currency of authority or a currency of contention, because now there's more than one person claiming to be caliph. In the, when you, the Abbasids were defeated in 750, the survivors of the Umayyad dynasty fled to Spain, and actually the Umayyad dynasty continued in Spain until around 1000 of the common year. And when the, uh, they just called themselves the Emirs, the Emir al-Mu'minin. When the Fatimid Shiites called themselves the Caliph, then the Umayyads in Spain also called themselves the Caliph. So around, I think it was the year 929, can you check that for me, Andy? 929, is that correct? I think so. Okay, 929, the, um, the Umayyad ruler in Spain also calls himself the caliph. So it's sort of like the, the period in the late 1300s and early 1400s in, in Italy and southern France when you have three popes. So now you have three caliphs. Exactly. So the reason why the term caliphate, one of the reasons it becomes more important is now a lot of people are, are, are claiming it, and so it ri its per currency ri raises, rises. Uh, 1558, Baghdad falls to the Mongols, and most of the Abbasid family is wiped out. Now, all of them because some of them flee to Egypt. And actually, this is important. The Abbasid Caliphate continues in Egypt under the protection of the Mamluk dynasty until 1517. And that's not just, people sometimes think that's, they, sometimes they call it the Shadow Caliphate. It, it's actually very important. And it's important not necessarily just for the Mamluk dynasty in Egypt and Syria. But Muslim states that are arising elsewhere in the Muslim world, at this time in the 1200s and 1300s, is when you really have expansion of Muslim rule in India, in Central Asia, uh, eventually in Southeast Asia in the 1400s and 1500s. The, the uh, Delhi Sultans, who were really the first major dynasty in India, from 1192 until the late 1300s when they were destroyed by Tamerlane, they, in the early 1300s, they get a letter of investiture from the Abbasid Caliph saying, I recognize you as my legitimate representatives in India. And that, that's so important that this letter is always read at the Friday prayer. And they, the Delhi Sultans actually build a whole city. Now if you go to the, if you ever go to Delhi, there's an area called Kauskos, uh, which now has really upscale, nice furniture shopping and good restaurants. But it's a, that actual area was called, uh, it was built for the a representative of the Abbasid dynasty. They built a whole little city just for a representative of the Abbasid dynasty to come. So an extremely powerful idea for legitimacy of Muslim rulers who are off, out there in what at the time were marginal areas. Um, now, so what happens in this period of, let's say, the 900s to the 1300s is the concept of caliphate becomes much less important. So you have this contestation over the, the title of caliph in the 900s and the 1000s. But by the late 1000s, early 1100s, the Fatimid dynasty is no longer a threat. The uh, Umayyad uh, dynasty in Spain has been conquered. And what really, from, you could say, around maybe 1100 to going up into maybe even the late middle, early modern period, the 1600s. The concept of caliphate is not very important anymore. Because by this time, it's really the notion of sultanate that is important. And it's not an Islamic notion of sultanate. It's a continuation of the pre-Islamic Near Eastern tradition of the Roman emperor, 
and the Persian emperor, which is that the ruler is God's shadow on earth. The ruler is God's shadow on earth. The ruler is, but deserves total obedience because it's also the ruler's duty to provide total justice. And this really becomes the, mod, the, 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 the mode of conceptualizing rule. And there's other streams that feed into this. So in the mid 1200s, when the Mongols invade the Middle East in 1250, and then you have a dynasty ruling most of Iraq and Iran until the early 1300s is a Mongol dynasty. And then the dynasty of Tamerlane from the late 1300s through the uh, early 1500s, mid 1500s in the Middle East, and through the 1700s in South Asia, the dynasty of Tamerlane, there are Mongols. Tamerlane marries a descendant, a daughter, a granddaughter, or a great granddaughter of Genghis Khan, and he rules as his title is the son in law. Tamerlane Damad, Tamerlane the son in law, i.e., the son, son in law of Genghis Khan. Because from the mid 1200s until almost up into the 1800s, it is descent from the golden family of Genghis Khan that gives you the right to rule. This is a totally a notion that's totally un Islamic, right? This is from outside the Islamic tradition. Marshall Hodgson calls this the age of Mongol prestige. It is descent from Mongol uh, heritage, especially the golden family of Genghis Khan, that gives you the right not only to rule Muslims, but the right to universal empire. And it's not the only notion of universal empire that, that feeds into notions of legitimate rule in the Islamic tradition in this time, because in 1453, when the Ottomans conquer Istanbul, what do they start calling themselves? Istanbul, or Constantinople is the capital of the Roman Empire. So who's the, ro the rule of the Roman Empire? It is Caesar. They call themselves Caesars. And they make the case to European monarchs that they have the right to universal empire because they are the inheritors of the Roman Empire. There's other ideas that uh, you, you'll see, the idea, the notion of being the next Alexander the Great. Going back to the pre-Islamic Near Eastern tradition of Alexander the Great receiving advice from his teacher Aristotle on how to be a just ruler. So Alexander the Great becomes the epitome of just rule and also the example of conquest and, and favor from God. The idea of the renewer, that's the word renewer, which you can probably barely read, uh, drawing on a hadith of the prophet in which he says that every hundred years God will send a renewer for his religion. Another, uh, here's the notion of descent from Genghis Khan, possessor of the fortunate conjunction. Not the most charismatic term in English, but in Arabic or in Persian, Sahib Quran, the one who owns or comes at the time of a certain planetary conjunction. Here, this is going back to pre-Islamic Near Eastern traditions of astrology, that the heavens have some, will, will tell you when certain events are propitious. And so when, when Tamerlane conquers Damascus in the early 1400s, the famous Muslim historian and uh, scholar Ibn Khaldun actually meets with uh, Tamerlane. And Tamerlane asks him about, you know, what do you think about my claims to rule and things like that. And he says, you're the possessor of the fortunate conjunction. This is the time when the, uh, the, the certain conjunction of planets has come about and you have the right to divide to, to, to universal empire because of that. And one of the, so let's take the Ottoman uh, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent who lives, rules from 1520 to 1566. You can see pictures of Suleiman the Magnificent, and over his head, or you know, there are paintings of him, it'll, they'll be titled, it'll say, Padishah Islam, the Emperor of Islam, Sahib Quran, the Possessor of the Fortunate Conjunction, the Mahdi, the rightly guided person who's the Messianic figure is supposed to come at the end of time, 1591 was the year 1000 in Islamic, on the Islamic calendar. So around that time, people were also thinking in terms of messianic, or the end of the world. And then, somewhere on that list you find Caliph. Whatever, Caliph is just one of the things that these people are at this point. And another thing that's very important, oh, oh I, I won't get into that actually. Um, <laughs> well, maybe in the question. So, 
So Caliph is, is, is really not an important title at this point. It's just one of the things you can be. Uh, I think psychologically for the Muslim world, it was very important. Because when Mustafa Kamal abolished, well, we're, we're still in the 1500s. <laughs> you're, you're way ahead of us. What? Okay. okay. So, some, uh, what, are, what are some other things that... Are you, 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 people are looking very antsy. Have you been listening for things for too long? Yeah. <laughs> if this were a class, I would give you a break. Bring, bring this up to the modern world. Okay. Why? Uh, you only want the modern world? No, no. Bring this that way. 1574. This is great. 1574. Sorry, 1774. Interesting event happened. The Ottoman Empire loses its first chunk of territory that's actually majority inhabited by Muslims to the Russians. It loses the north shore of the Black Sea. And there's an agreement that the Ottomans come up with in the Treaty of Kuchuk Kanarja in 1774 with Catherine the Great, where she acknowledges the Ottoman Sultan as the Caliph of the Muslims, even in Russian territory. Why is this important? Because what this means is now there's this idea that the, the, there's a Muslim ruler who is the Caliph. In this case, it happens to be the Ottomans. Because they're just one of the people who call themselves Caliph in the, in the, in the 1700s. He is recognized by the Russians as the protector, or at least the sort of religious leader of the Muslims who live under Russian rule. By the mid-1800s, at that point, it's become very obvious to the Ottoman Empire, which at this point becoming increasingly weak, that various European countries, Great Britain, France, Italy, uh, Russia, have uh, designs on encroaching on Ottoman sovereignty. But nobody wants to actually destroy the empire because that means someone else might take content of all of it. It's not the British or the Russians. They don't, they want to basically keep the empire propped up, but while increasing their own, each country's own influence on the, the, the area of the Ottoman Empire. So what the Ottomans start doing in the mid-1800s is they realize that this notion of caliphate can actually be a very useful tool in foreign policy. By the way, later, in, in 1517, when the Ottomans conquer Cairo, they actually, the, the last Abbasid Caliph, Mutawakkil II, actually goes and surrenders the Ottoman Sultan Salim, the Grim. And Salim says, No, nice to meet you. Sends him back to Istanbul for a couple of years where he lives as a guest, and then he goes right to Cairo and dies there. Later on, in the 1700s and 1800s, you have this idea that Salim, the last Abbasid Caliph, transferred the Caliphate to Salim. This, there's no evidence this actually happened. Selim didn't write home. He wrote a letter home to his son saying, I just conquered the entire Middle East. And he didn't say, by the way, I own also the Caliph now, in case you know, that will impress you. There's no mention of this. It's not important. It's only later on in the, in the late 1700s, the 1800s, that the Ottomans start bringing out this idea that they're the Caliph as something special. And not just list item number seven on the list of why they have the right to universal empire. So, for example, during the uh, first war of independence slash the Indian Mutiny in 1857, the British asked the Ottoman Sultan to issue a ruling as the ruler of theory of Muslims around the world, the Ottoman Caliph, to say to the, the, the Muslim rebels, of course there was rebellion both by Hindus and Muslim soldiers, that you should not rebel against the British. That didn't work. But the point is, uh, that's, you can start seeing how the Ottomans realize they have this tool they can use. And in the, the last time this is used is in November 1914, November 1914, when the Ottomans officially join with the Germans in, on the, in World War I, they issue a declaration of jihad to all the Muslims in the world, especially the ones living under British rule in India and North Africa and France, right? And North Africa, French colonies in North Africa. Saying, fight with the Caliph against your, the enemies of the Caliph. God. So this becomes, it's, that also doesn't really work. But the, you can see how this is becoming an important tool. Now, in, in, finally, we're now at the end, so you can all relax. 1924, the uh, 
Turkish parliament or the parliament of the new Republic of Turkey abolishes the caliphate. Uh, and now, in the, in the, from the end of the World War I into 1924, and in fact beyond that, there's a movement that rises, especially in South Asia, a British India called the Khilafat Movement, which is really Muslims outside the Ottoman Empire, especially South Asia, in emphasizing the importance of the caliphate and urging the Turkish Republic not to, the, the authorities to take over after the fall of the Ottoman dynasty, not to abolish the caliphate because of this, its important role as a symbolic leader in the Muslim world. And when it gets abolished in 1924, then you have real, uh, it's not so much a crisis, but uh, m Muslims in especially the Middle East had looked to the Ottoman Empire as a potential political point of political rally. And Muslims outside of the Middle East in South Asia and Southeast Asia had looked to the Ottoman Empire as a model for an alternative notion of modernity, a non-Western alternative <coughs> to modernity. People don't remember this, but the Ottoman Empire had totally reformed its legal system, totally reformed its educational system, totally reformed its infrastructure, had railroads, had everything, had telegraphs. In fact, they, they fought really well in World War I. A third of the, all the British troops were stationed in, in the Middle East on Ottoman borders. Uh, if the Germans had happened and the Ottomans had won World War I, people would look to the Ottoman Empire as this victorious. It was victorious because they had reformed, because they had modernized. So people looked at the Ottoman Empire with a sense of hope as a model for mod an Islamic modernity. After they fall, that model is gone, and they have people to look for other alternative models. European generals running. Okay. So that's kind of a history of uh, concessions. the caliphate. What is, how does this relate to ISIS? I would say it relates in this way. There is really no agreed upon list of what you have to do to be the caliph, or what you have to be to be the caliph. Muslims, some Muslim scholars said you have to be descendant of the Quraysh. The Ottomans weren't descendants of the Quraysh, and they didn't care. Because other major Muslim scholars, for example, Abu Imam al Haraman and Juvaini in the 10 hundreds, he says, Quraysh descent is not a requirement for the caliph. So the Ottomans said, we're the caliphs, but we're not Quraysh from the Quraysh tribe, because the Quraysh tribe is, that is not a requirement to be the caliph. Only some Muslim scholars require the, uh, the caliph to be, it's uh, probably the majority. But historically, the, most of the people who claimed the title of caliph from the 1500s onward were not Arabs. They not only were they not descendants of Christ, they weren't even Arabs. And they still claim to be the caliphs. So why is it that the Ottoman claim to caliphate was believed, and a lot of the other dynasties that we didn't get into a claim to be caliph, why is it they were not we're not talking about them when we talk about the caliphs? Because the Ottomans happened to realize in the late 1700s to mid 1800s that the idea of being caliph and appealing as a religious authority to Muslims outside your territory, and in fact under European or under Christian rule, that this was a certain, uh, gave you a certain uh, leverage, potential leverage in, in relation to non-Muslim countries. And they used that, and this was believed by especially the European powers. And so that's what really gives us the idea that the Ottomans somehow are the, are the bearers of the caliphate. And that in 1924, the end of the caliphate, was is some major moment. Uh, in reality, you could have a Turkic warlord who happens to take over all the Middle East and then gets up and says, I'm the caliph, and he would have just as, pretty much just as much a right to do that as uh, anybody else. What makes somebody res you know, followed as a caliph is their success as a, as a state or as a leader. If you take over and you call yourself the caliph and you have a lot of power and you can command territory and uh, defeat your enemies, you'll probably be considered a legitimate caliph. Okay, thanks very much, and uh, we can now have questions for both of us, I guess.